for all those. Recording in progress. Recording in progress. Yo, just put your volume all the way up. Um, into the room at like 6.30. Josh, like, what? The screen's so high, right? So I can move my head. I'd like to be there. My head cut off. It's going to be really sad. Sorry, just going to wait another minute or so. Okay, I think we'll get started. Let me share my screen. As people come in, we'll admit them. Uh, Okay, so good evening, everyone. We're honored to feature Paralympian gold medalist Nick Mayhew tonight as our guest speaker. Um, before we start, we we'll ask everybody to put on their mute. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, please use the chat to submit them um, and any comments as we go so we can keep them in one spot. Um, at, this, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. and Mrs. Murphy uh, to open up the session tonight. Great. Thanks a lot, Josh. Uh, greetings, everyone, and welcome uh, to Centenary, Nick. Uh, we have here tonight our student athletes and coaches, uh, Professor Dave Paracone and his students from Sport Marketing and Management, and many of our esteemed alumni. Uh, well, the, uh, the Tokyo 2020 Olympics and Paralympic Games were a huge success and showed our strength and resilience during the pandemic. Uh, the Games truly demonstrated peace through sport. Nick is here tonight to share his experience with us and to help us become stronger as we all move through these challenging times. I asked my spouse, Jean, to give briefly give us a framework for the Paralympic Games since she served as Team USA's Chief of Mission for the 2004 Games in Athens. All right, good evening, Nick, and welcome to Centenary. And uh, Josh, if you just put that one slide up of, uh, of me of the 2004 Games real quick. Uh, very good, there we go. Nick, I, I'm wearing my 2004 Athens jacket here tonight, and that's uh, me with the, leading the team in as chief of mission. Probably one of uh, the greatest honors uh, I've had is representing Team USA in, in the Games of Athens and the Paralympic team. And my chief uh, assistant chef uh, of mission, Scott Douglas, a gold medalist in tennis, wheelchair tennis. And what Scott demonstrates and what a lot of uh, athletes at Nix is uh, affiliated with, you can be born with a, some type of physical disability or you can also get in an accident. You could be a wounded warrior. There are many ways to enter the Paralympic Games. And uh, it is phenomenal in terms of the elite 
uh, nature of the athletes and the sport competitions, uh, the highest standards of excellence are achieved in the Paralympics. Uh, this year in, in uh, Tokyo, Team USA brought 234 athletes. There were 4,400 other athletes from the, around the world who competed, 22 different sports. It was an unprecedented 1,200 hours of global viewing by NBC uh, Universal Broadcasts which makes you, Nick Mayhew, truly a rock star. And we are gonna really enjoy listening to you and, and watching all your accomplishments. And uh, uh, Josh, if you wanna show that one minute video, you all see uh, me and, and our delegation in 2004, we'll show you what Nick, and tr try to find Nick in the U Team USA delegation marching into the oh, total state. <laughs> and now the moment United perhaps States many of you of have been waiting for Team America. USA. So there is Team USA. We mentioned it before. Chuck Aoki, a flag bearer. Melissa Stockwell, there is Chuck's mother, Jen. Live waving from Trenton, New Jersey. Getting to see Chuck out, Chuck out there inside National Stadium. Messages from her to him, although he can't see that yet. Messages from the athletes to the loved ones back home right now that are watching from afar. What a moment. There are so many names and faces and, and stars and potential stars that may have emerged over the last year here. Uh, Ezra Freck, who we saw earlier. Hunter Woodhall, who's also a TikTok star. Tatiana McFadden, 23 Paralympic medals. Uh, 17 Paralympic medals, excuse me, for Tatiana McFadden, 23 for France. Jess Long. Nick, our, our last thing before turning it over to you, we wanted the audience to see your outstanding gold medal performance. Uh, Josh, if you beam that video up and then we'll be all on track. Here we go. Nice video to start now. He seems so collected, so composed on this stage. And Chris, it's pretty impressive when you think about the fact that this is the first major event he has run at 18 months into his track and field career. It's the first track event, but he also oh, scored 34 oh. goals for the for the seven-a-side soccer team. This guy is used to being the focal point, and he looks purposeful. 11 seconds, breaking 11 seconds, is just a step along the way is what it looks like to him. We'll see how much faster he can go. Watch the, for the first 30 meters as he's able to keep his head down. The longer he's able to stay down in that position, the longer he's going to be able to build his speed and reach top end speed closer to the end of the race. Set. There they go, the 100 meter T37 final. Good starts for Mayhew and Port Normo. Now Nick Mayhew surges to the front. Nick Mayhew starts his pursuit of three golds with another world record, 1095. Oh my gosh, we predicted that it could happen. It did, he delivered. He rose to the moment and he knew that he had the ability to do that. And still this is the beginning for him as well. He has other events. Absolutely spectacular. This He's just scratching the surface. And he knows what he's just accomplished. All that hard work has paid off. So it's the first gold medal of a possible trifecta for Nick Mayhew. 11 second times today. Well, the new world record holder and gold medalist is with Lewis. All right, and the first thing I heard from Nick was, I told you, and you did, you told us when you set the first world record this morning, how did you come back and do it again even better? Just believing in myself. You know, my coach said, put on your headphones, knock it all in the noise, come back and do it again. That's exactly what I did. 
Take us through the race from the start as you made your way down the track, building that speed. I just, you know, I just need to get out, get out well. My start is, you know, unfortunately the worst part of my race, and I knew if I just got out well, and once I get up, nobody in the world can catch me. And I think one of the greatest shots I saw was as you were coming close to the finish line. I thought you were looking over to see that time. Is that right? Absolutely. Wow. I think I could have ran a little faster if I didn't check the time, but I won. Just explain to everybody how you were able to accomplish this 18 months into your track and field career from soccer. Just, just amazing. Anybody watching this, believe in yourself. So many people told me I would not be here today. When I got here, nobody knew my name. And when I leave, everybody's going to know. Wow. Incredible start. Maybe more gold medals to come, but Absolutely. congrats on the first one. Nick. I appreciate it. Thank you. You got it. Okay, um, Nick, um, this is where we'll, we'll turn it over to you. Um, and we'll have our, our students, Matias and Megan, um, ask you questions uh, when, you're, when you're done uh, speaking to the group. All right, well, uh, hello everybody. My name is, uh, is Nick Mayhew, thank you for having me. You know, this was a uh, no brainer opportunity, you know, to come on and speak to, you know, such an incredible group like like you all, you know, it's, it's an honor to be here. So thank you. You know, you, you got to watch a few of the a few of the races that I, that I participated in in Tokyo. And, you know, it's I know somebody's going to ask, you know, how what it, what it feel like, you know, how how does it feel to, you know, have done what you did and everything. And to be honest, as cliche as it sounds, there's no words to, you know, what I did. And, you know, there's a lot of work that got put into it. Um, you know, you know, being born with a disability that when went undiagnosed till I was 14 years old, you know, I, I remember growing up playing soccer at the highest level as I could my entire life, you know, being told that I wasn't good enough, being told that, you know, my left, my left foot wasn't good enough. And I, if I couldn't play with two feet, then I couldn't go pro. And, you know, all those things, coaches and teammates telling me that I couldn't do what I'd set out to do for myself. And, you know, I, I always believed I have it tattooed on my leg. On my right leg, I have the word believe tattooed there. And, you know, I, I always believe that I could do it, you know, up until I was 14 years old. I was with the DC United Academy um, soccer program at the time. I was playing with them for almost two and a half years, almost three years. And, you know, to, to really put it into, to put it into perspective, um, you know, I'd worked, I, I'd started in, in the program as just a practice player. So I was traveling 45 minutes, four times a week. Um, to, to play in a, an hour and a half practice and just practice and not even get to travel to games or anything. And, I, you know, I worked my butt off month after month to really prove myself that I could. And I knew that, you know, there's nobody that was going to step on that field that had a better work ethic than I did. And, you know, with or without my left side, you know, no matter how affected my left side was, I knew that, you know, if I put in the work that there was nobody next to me that would, you know, be able to outwork and, you know, outperform me. And I was given an opportunity to uh, start in two games, my coach pulled me aside on Friday's practice before we traveled on Saturday and said up to New York Red Bulls and said, you know, we're going to play two games up in New York. You have two opportunities to prove yourself and we'll have a conversation Monday, um, you know, regardless of how well or, or poor you perform. And, you know, those two games, I were the two, two of the best games that I'd ever played in my entire career to date. And, you know, I scored two goals in each game and went home on Monday you know, and there were University of Maryland, UVA, Georgetown, UCLA, uh, U.S. national team scouts, you know, everybody was there and getting to talk to everybody after the games and, you know, just feel so good about myself. You know, I was 13, 14 at that time. And to be able to told, be, be able to have those conversations with Division One scouts and, you know, have that conversation of, you know, you always get to, to you know, go to a school of your dreams. And at that time, it was the University of Maryland. And I got to play in front of them and, and really outperform, you know, what I thought I could do. And, you know, just something that I always believed that I could do. And, you know, I played really well. They told me they were going to take care of me. And um, so that was that Monday that my coach told me that I won the starting spot. You know, I, I, I earned it. And that was that Monday in 2010, November 13th. I'll never forget it. And three days later, um, that Thursday morning, I woke up and had a grand mal seizure and lost everything. I went from cloud nine to rock bottom in a matter of four days. And the neurologist um, 
walked into the medical room and I remember laying there on, on the hospital bed and her coming in and putting my MRI up on the wall and you could see the big dead spot. If any of you have seen my Instagram or seen any of my merchandise that I have, you see my MRI um, and the dead spot on the right side of my brain that um, affects the left side of my body. And she looked me dead in the eye and told me that I would never be able to play soccer again. And, you know, my entire world was flipped upside down. So, you know, to, to, you know, go home Monday night and tell my mom that, you know, I would be able to take care of her and, you know, I was going to go pro in soccer and do all these things. And then that Thursday to be, you know, told that I would never be playing, be able to play soccer again. You know, I can't, I can't really replicate those feelings that I felt at 14. You know, my entire world was upside down and I felt like I lost everything. And, you know, I could have given up. It was the easiest thing to do in the world to give up at that time. But I knew that that's not what I had planned for myself. I knew that that's not what you know, I was about and I knew that I could, you know, I just set my mind to it. I could get back out on the pitch and, um, and and really try to pursue this as a career. And that's exactly what I did. So I worked tirelessly, did everything I could as corny and as cliche as it sounds. Uh, you know, I just put in the work and I just practiced every single day after school. I remember getting home from high school practice, getting home from academy practice. I used to drive two and a half hours up to um, up to a different state to train for an hour to with an academy team just to get looks at from college scouts and everybody just to just to come back down not even play games and just to get looked at and get an opportunity and then I was lucky enough to get um get an opportunity at Radford University in Southern Virginia and you know I was able to play four and a half years there I was injured three out of the four years there and and you know to you think that the story is going to get any better but it just gets it's a roller coaster it gets a little worse every time so. Um, you know, my freshman, sophomore and junior year, I was riddled with injuries and just, you know, the amount of adversity that I tried to I had to try to overcome to, you know, um, get to where I am today is is, you know, crazy to really think about, you know, in the position that I am now. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people ask me, you know, is there ever a time that you had any doubt or any negativity or anything? And I can I can honestly say that I don't remember how many times I thought about quitting my freshman, sophomore and junior year. You know, I was. I went from, you know, the the best in my in my state at what I did in playing football and, and, and you know, playing soccer at, at the professional collegiate level and to to literally somebody that was told that they would never play soccer again. And then I come to college and shatter my collarbone my freshman year and then partially tore my hamstring my sophomore year and then, you know, was given an opportunity to, to become healthy and play my junior year and, you know, score a goal on homecoming night in front of the entire crowd and everybody and really win that starting spot as a, as a junior, as, as a disabled athlete and, and a junior and a walk, consider it a walk on everything against me. And, you know, to come in and really prove myself, you know, meant everything to me. And, you know, that was on a Wednesday. I came in, scored, a, scored the game winning goal, um, homecoming night versus Winthrop. And three days later um, at High Point University, uh, their left back came in and two foot tackled me and I completely tore my left MCL. And I was out for the rest of the year, my junior year, you know, and, and just at that moment, I remember that was the biggest part of my career that I remember just saying that I wanted to give up. I remember calling my brother and saying, you know, I'm done. You know, I don't want to go through surgery. I don't want to go through rehab. I don't want to do all these things that I knew I had to do. And he just stopped me in my tracks and really just reminded me of why I do what I do from the start. You know, my family, my mom, um, you know, and, and just what I'd really fell in love in the game for or fell in love with, you know, the sport of soccer and fell in love with the game at first, you know, and, and remembered why I did it and knew that I couldn't give up then. And to go on and then find the uh, Paris 7 side national team and, you know, to be a, such a pivotal part of, of the program now, you know, having 34 goals in, in just 25 games and 31 assists is, is insane to even say out loud. Um, and to have one U.S. Soccer Player of the Year in 2019 is, is such a great honor for me and my teammates, um, you know, in – to be able to be to where I am today, you know, to really understand what my body needs to perform, what I, and how much time and, and rest and recovery I need to do to get to a, my body to perform, you know, and, and the sacrifices that I had to make to then be told in 2019 after I won player of the year that soccer wasn't going to be on the program for Tokyo. And then it was always a dream for me to be able to represent my country on the highest level, um, being the Olympics and, you know, not, and having that opportunity stripped away from me. To then have Team USA reach out and call me and say, have you ever run track before? And I said, no, like, I, I, not professionally. I never really took it serious, but I'd always ran track and field distance just to stay fit for soccer. But and they, they reached out and asked me if I wanted to run. And, and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. You know, and from that day forward, I remember going on Google, typing in 
you know, my classification, typing in world record. I didn't even look up the times. I didn't look up the qualifying, anything. I went straight to the top and, and typed in, you know, world record times, T37, 100, 200, 400. And I, I wrote down those times and put them up on my wall. I had them in my wall um, in every single room of, of my apartment, you know, from the from November 2019 through all, the, all throughout Tokyo, knowing that I was sitting across the table from my coach. And he said, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go to Tokyo and I want to win a gold medal as a soccer athlete back in 2019. And he got up and walked out of the room and laughed at me because that's virtually impossible. Scientifically, biologically, at 23 years old, that's impossible to transform a marathon athlete to a track athlete and uh, a sprint athlete. And, you know, and, and I can proudly say that I did it and I really put in the work. And that next day I came in and sat across from my coach and I said, and before he could even speak, before he could even sit down, I said, coach, I'm going to go to Tokyo and I'm going to win a gold medal. And it sounds cliche and it sounds corny and it sounds like it would be in a movie, but that's how you have to treat your life, you know, and that's exactly what I did. And for the next 18 to 19 months, I did nothing but, but work my butt off and, and sacrifice going out with my friends, sacrifice, you know, you know, good times, vacations and, and drinking and, and doing a you know, doing some fun things that, you know, everybody sees on social media and everything nowadays, you know, just to have oh, fun. I sacrificed it all, you know, for, for almost two years of my, of my life. I was training 10 hours a day, six days a week. You know, Sunday was my only off day. And I got to, and I spent the entire day just lying in my bed, watching Netflix, watching movies and recovering. And, you know, to try to learn an entire sport in less than two years is completely insane, but that's truly how I perceive myself and as a person and as an athlete, you have to be a little bit insane to, to reach the top and, you know, to be able to go to Tokyo and, and, you know, in my mind, know that I'm going to go there and run in four races. And, and I, my goal was to break four world records, win four gold medals in, in those four events, four for four for four. And, you know, I, I, I was able to accomplish three of the four and, um, you know, win silver in the 400 in the fourth event. And, you know, I, I can't be upset about that. And it just goes to show, you know, that there's no matter what you're dealt with in life, you know, no matter this, the speed bumps, medical or not, you know, you're able, if you just put your mind to it and, and, and stick to it and do what you have to do, set aside your phone, set aside the good time, set aside all the, all the social media and materialistic things nowadays in 2021 and, and things that are in the modern day life. If you just set that aside and just traditionally work hard, at what you do, then you can, then you can be successful. And that's, you know, what I've tried to do. And I've tried to, you know, be as, um, as professional, as humble as possible, but, you know, at the same time, you know, I'm proud of what I've done. I've put in the work and I've really, you know, you know, I've really just started to scratch the surface of what I'm able to do. And I can sit here and look at you guys and really honestly say that I'm going to work harder than every single person that I'm going to be running against in 2024 in Paris. I haven't qualified for Paris just because I won doesn't mean I'm going to be there. And I can already tell you that I'm going to be there. I'm going to qualify and I'm going to do exactly what I did in Tokyo in Paris. I'm going to run four events. I'm going to break four world records, my own world records, which is cool enough to say and win four gold medals. And, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I appreciate you guys having me on, you know, like I said earlier, there's no questions that I will not answer um, no matter how personal, how, you know, emotional or sensitive the question may be, you know, I'm here to answer your questions. And I really appreciate, you know, the honor of, of you allowing me to come on and speak to you today. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome, man. Um, so we'll have a couple questions here from uh, Matthias and Megan. Um, you know, whichever one of you guys wants to go first. Um, just to see what Nick can touch upon a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you, Nick, for joining us tonight. Really appreciate you being here. Um, I have a question for you. So I actually run cross country as well. What motivates you to run the most? Because <laughs> I know it's hard for me in the morning to get up. <laughs> see, that's, that's, that's the craziest thing is that, you know, there were more days than not that I did not want to get up and train, you know, and, and I was flexible enough to be able to, you know, have the liberty of being able to kind of choose when I wanted to train. Um, you know, there were, there were a lot of days that I work better later in the day. I work better, you know, uh, that I would get to, I get my sleep, I wake up, I have, you know, the first morning of my day to be able to just relax, get ready for the rest of the day. And then, you know, um, get a, I'm able to train and 
leading up to Tokyo, because the time zones were so different, I actually trained later in the day because I knew I was going to compete in the morning um, because they're 13 hours ahead of Eastern time. So it was kind of structured like that, that I was had the liberty of being able to train in the evening just because it worked with what was going on in Tokyo. But to answer your question, it's hard. Um, it's not natural. It's not easy. But you just have to remind yourself and, and know, you know, you should, I mean, like what I used to do when I was in college, when I would have to get up for 6 a.m. workouts, what I would do is set my phone because nowadays that's the first thing you check up, you check when you, when you wake up. And before I'll go to bed, I would set my phone and set my alarm on the loudest ringer on the loudest um, volume. And I would put it in the opposite side of my room. So I would have to get up out of bed and go get my phone to, to be able to turn it off. That's something that worked for me personally. Um, I used to have my phone and I used to have my laptop and I, I downloaded a, a, an alarm app that literally I had to type in a code in my alarm to turn it off on my laptop. And then I was able to do something on my phone. And those are just a little, you know, tricks that I, I did for myself, but just, just strip it down to the basics of why you do what you do. You know, it, it's not natural. You're going to wake up. There's going to be days where you don't want to do it, but you just have to remember why you started in the first place, why you fell in love with the sport and, you know, what motivates you to do it and never forget that. And, you know, just, just do it. You just have to get up and just do it. And as soon as you get out of bed, that's the hardest part because your bed's so comfy. You're so warm. Your comfort is so, it's so nice. Uh, I can't wait to go to sleep tonight. I'm so excited, but um, you know, it's hard and it's not natural, but you, you have to do it. And you know that there's an, if you, as long as you know that you're getting out of bed and there's another athlete in the world that is choosing to sleep in, you're getting more out of your day than that, than that person. So you just got to do it. Thank you. Matias, do you have a question? Yeah, um, so to kind of talk about um, Tokyo, how was it living in the athletes' village in Tokyo? It was it was interesting. You know, the the cardboard beds were real. Um, they were literally cardboard. Um, they were very uncomfortable. Um, I was lucky enough. I actually made a deal. All the all the staff and the the medical staff and the coaches all got Tempur-Pedic nectar beds. Nobody's talking about that. Everyone's talking about the the cardboard beds, the uncomfortable beds the athletes had to sleep on. Nobody's talking about the comfy big full and queen size beds that the that the staff was able to sleep on and i actually made a deal with one of the uh with one of the u.s staff that had to leave early go back to their to their full-time job back in the states and i said you know if i win the 100 and i break the world record can i get your your bed and they said yeah so i was lucky enough to be able to sleep on sleep on one of those beds you know a majority of the time but those cardboard beds were, were something real. They were very uncomfortable, made out of cardboard. The mattress is literally shavings of plastic. I have pictures, you know, it's, it's crazy. Um, but it was amazing. You know, it's just a melting pot of, of athletes, you know, across the world, obviously. And to be able to, you know, um, see how those athletes are and their culture, you know, to be able to meet them and, um, you know, speak to them and, and watch them work. And you have to remember, like, I'm, I'm still new to the sport of track and field. So I would go to the practice track and just sit there and just watch these these guys work, you know, watch. And I'm, I'm well versed in, in the soccer world. You know, I, I can go to a football or a football pitch and, you know, sit there and know what somebody's doing right and what somebody's doing wrong and know what I'm going to do um, when I step on the pitch. And, you know, um, that's that's second nature to me. But I walk onto a track and that's not normal for me, you know, and, and it's weird to say that, you know, the accolades that I have is cool. But, you know, I, I still go to a track and just sit and watch people train see what they do, see when they warm up, see how they, you know, how they cool down and see what they do in their workouts to get better. And especially, you know, certain parts of my races and I'm not, accept, I'm not good at, but that's what I spend a majority of my time. I, I stayed after and stayed at, at the track for hours, just watching other guys work that I was, that I would be able to compete against knowing that it's just an individual um, race. Like it's just you and the clock, but that person running next to you, I would watch him run. And I knew that if he did this in a race that I could see him in my peripheral, that I would win. And, you know, just seeing certain things like that to make them tick and, you know, just to see how nervous everybody was. It's just to be able to spend that time around, you know, that amount of incredible athletes. You have to remember, you know, you're a part. I was lucky enough to be a part of, of you know, an Olympics that, you know, hopefully will never happen again um, in, in Tokyo. You know, the COVID situation and everything, hopefully, you know, we'll never have to experience that again, you know, um, health willing. But, you know, this is just an incredible experience to be able to say, you know, on one hand, I was able to go into Olympics, which people work for their entire life and are unable, never able to achieve. And then on the other, to be able to say, you know, I was a part of the Tokyo 2020 COVID pandemic Olympics. And, you know, it's 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 pretty cool. But, you know, it's it hasn't really hit me yet. 
You know, it hasn't hit me that I actually win. It hasn't hit me that I'm back already. I did what I did, but I'm waiting for it. So I'm excited. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have another question. What do you, so you, you broke multiple world records. Where do you see yourself taking next, like next five, 10 years? Where, what do you think? That is a, that is a long, that is a long, long answer. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of things, the way that I work, the way that I, I become very hyper-focused in what I'm doing, you know, with soccer, I definitely, you know, I, I wanted, when I was in college, I wanted to, you know, become a starter, score, score, and win a couple championships. And that's exactly what I did. And, you know, to be able to achieve all those things, I, I did those things. And then I, the way that I work, the way that my mind works is just, I'm never satisfied with, and with what I'm doing. You know, I, I achieve one thing and it's always just what's next, you know, and whatever it may be. And, you know, I was able to then join the Paris 7 side national team and be able to say, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, perform as best I could become number one in the world as a team and, you know, win player of the year and do all these things. And, you know, I have, we're not ranked fourth in the world right now. So I'm still on track to, to do that. So that's definitely something I'm passionate about is, is helping the team become number one in the world. And it's definitely a tough task. It's going to be a team effort. It's not like track and field where you can just run out there and run really fast and win and then boom, you're number one. Cool. You know, it's but in the world of track and field, I want to go back to Tokyo. I want to go back to Paris um, in the next Olympics in 2024 and do it all over again. You know, I, I came second in the 400. And, you know, that really that really, uh, for lack of a better word, really pisses me off because I really want to win that. So um, my doctor definitely doesn't want me training for that because uh, cerebral palsy is a neurological disorder. The training for the 400 is super, super tough. Um, it's really dangerous on my body and my brain. But just the way that I work, I need to I need to get that I need to get that um, that gold medal in that. So I will be running the 400 again in, in Paris. Um, but there are a couple other things I want to do. You know, I'm in the process of writing my own book. Um, I'm in the process of starting my own foundation um, that I'm super passionate about, you know, just giving back to, you know, the disabled community and doing what I can for people who can't afford, um, you know, Botox, who can't afford um prosthetics or operations and things to really help them. Um, that's something I'm super passionate about. And publicly speaking is another one. You know, I really love, enjoy coming on and, um, you know, answering questions and interacting with people. And I, I would love to be able to make a career out of that. But, um, you know, my own merchandise, my own clothing line, things, you know, just, I, and my real goal, my number one goal above sport and everything, I, when I'm all set and done and, um, you know, my knees willing, my knees are really the only thing that's going to retire me. You know, I could compete to the day I die, but I don't think my knees can. Um, but my number one thing is that I want to, uh, I want to open a little coffee and breakfast shop on the beach somewhere. I want to open like a little shack and, you know, just make coffee and hire some, hire a chef to make some omelets and breakfast food and just hang out and have long hair and live on the beach. That's my, that's my real goal, to be honest. But that's a long list and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things added to it, but you know, I'm just going to do my best to enjoy, enjoy the ride. Let me know where your shack is. I'll be your number one customer. I'll let you, I, I promise you, I'll let you know. And you'll have a, you'll have free meals for life. I got you guys. Works All, for me. There you go. <laughs> All right. So I guess like looking at the short term, do you have any like short term girls goals for like the next month or a couple of years? For the next month, uh, to enjoy the the little time I have left of my off season, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I've been in there for for a long, long time. I wasn't able to go, you know, on, on a vacation and really just be able to decompress and just enjoy my family, enjoy the time that I have with my friends, um, and just hang out with my mom and have breakfast and, you know, just just pick her brain about normal stuff that you know, 14, 13 year old Nick would ask, you know, just things that I really lost, you know, while training and really committing to, to my career and my sport and, and the things that really matter in life, you know, you know, I get oftentimes I, I get caught up in my career and I get caught up, you know, traveling and um, training and, you know, the job aspect of playing, um, playing a sport and, and training for, for a sport full-time. It, it's a, it's a real full-time job and it's a career and it's tough, but, you know, I, I often lose myself in it and it's the hardest thing. You know, I, I can, I can be honest with you guys and tell you that I have two separate therapists that I work with and speak to weekly, um, you know, and it's tough. And those are, those are a lot of emotional things that I'm still trying to work out for myself and my own personal life to help me in my career. Um, I struggle 
um, you know, mental health stuff is serious. And, and it's something that I'm trying to still learn with. So my, so my, you know, month to two months to end of the year goal is to enjoy the rest of, of my time off and um, really try to mold my business plan as a whole going forward and, you know, get back to training and just stay healthy. Um, you know, that's, that's probably the only goals that I have and, and just small goals, little incremental things that then lead up to the bigger picture that is, you know, um 2020 and the competitions that i have going forward so you know that's pretty much it i i, I hope you get to see your family soon thank you man i appreciate it um so you kind of talk about yourself um but like who inspires you like who's your role model who do you look up to Um, you know, it's, I don't really think that I have a set, I don't think that I have a set role model, um, you know, somebody that a single person that I really look up to or something. It's just people, numerous people that I lean on, um, for guidance and advice and just motivation. And that's truly just my family. You know, my brother, um, is five and a half years older than me has done more for me than I'll ever be able to repay him. My mom, my dad, and the things that they are, my, my family really are, are all my role models and people and the, and the true motivation of I do what I do. You know, my mom, I'm a mama's boy through and through. I, I am, you know, I'm a little kid, mama's boy, you know, and, and I have no problem admitting that to the day I die. You know, she is the sole reason why I do what I do to be able to, you know, be in the position to, you know, uh, to put her in a position to never have to work again. That's my main focus and the reason why I do what I do, you know, and, and my brother to be able to have him and um, to, to, you know, be there and be by my side every step of the way and really push me and, and coach me and really understand the work that I put into this um, and, you know, to be there and, and to, you know, be, be the man he is and be, um, you know, a, a true role model and, and coach and best friend and, you know, everything that I need him to be just a, just a brother. Um, those are probably my, my role models. Um, you know, but I look up a lot, I look up to a lot of professional athletes, you know, that have become my friends that we've gravitated towards each other to really push each other to be successful. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, two of my best friends are Christian Pulisic and, and Weston McKinney, you know, who are two of the best at what they do in America and, you know, are great or, you know, have the, have the opportunity to play overseas and, you know, the conversations that I have with them and, just the advice that they give me and the advice that I give them, you know, I'm older than them, but I still look at them as, you know, for advice to, to deal with certain things that I, you know, that I struggle with and they, and they do the same in me. Um, we really just feed off each other. And, um, and probably the biggest one in the sport of track and field was Usain Bolt. Um, you know, I, I literally, from the day I started training for track and field, I would YouTube videos of Usain Bolt um, and, and just watch him run and really just go frame by frame and watch him walk, like, watch him run and watch him race and really just try to uh, replicate what he was doing on the track. Um, and we're obviously, you know, two different body types, two different genetic, um, you know, he's a genetic freak and I'm not. So uh, I'm kind of at a disadvantage genetically, but, um, you know, I, I tried to replicate him and I really looked up to him. So, you know, in, in, you know, in Tokyo, I was able to receive a video from him. He actually watched me race and told, and I actually was able to have a conversation with him. So that was surreal. Um, to, to, you know, be in that position, but, you know, it, it's not, there's not really a single person. It's just kind of a group of people that I trust, you know, that I hold close to me and um, people that I, I try to reach out to, to gain a little bit of guidance um, in, in whatever it is that I'm trying to do. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Do we have time for more questions or? We can, if you have another couple of questions, Matisse, you could ask. Okay. Um, so like you mentioned Christian Pulisic and Weston McKinney. Um, like, what do you think draws you guys together? Our mentality. Uh, that's, that, uh, that's, that's definitely the biggest thing. You know, the, the, the willingness to sacrifice, you know, something to, to then gain something else that, you know, that, that you, we, that is the long-term play. Um, you know, the, the talent and the God given, the God given talent uh, of being able to do what they do is one thing. That's something you can't teach. 
Um, but you know, something else that you can't teach is just the mentality and the heart that, that somebody has. And, and, you know, I, the first time that I met them and, and, you know, years ago, just kind of talking about them, uh, talking to them about, you know, what they wanted to do when Christian was still, you know, in the U S before he went to Europe at all. And, you know, when Wes was at FC Dallas and, you know, to, to be able to grow up and play against them is one thing and really, you know, battle against them, um, growing up and, and then to able to be able to see them, you know, be, on the world stage and, you know, to see West have a scissor kick against Barcelona was to be able to FaceTime him after the game and be like, man, you, you just, you just did that. Like what, like, that's crazy. And you're on the same field with Cristiano and like Cristiano and doing all these things. And, you know, it's crazy. And it's a surreal, you know, conversation to have that that's quote unquote normal um, um, for somebody like that. But to then to you know see Christian to to do what he's doing at Chelsea and hopefully he's able to get healthy and stay healthy, um, but you know and to win a Champions League is insane you know and you know it was a point in my life where I would I would be you know um, playing FIFA you know with with Wes and Christian that like playing with them as players and now to consider them two of my best two of my best friends you know to really lean on for advice and they do the same to me you know it's it's a crazy thing but. Um, you know, it's just the mentality that we have to to want to be the best at what we do, no matter what it is. You know, um, one of the coolest things about Christian is that he's a really good chess player, and and I hit and I, it, it's the most frustrating thing because I try so hard, and I will literally sit on Facetime for like six hours playing chess, and he just beats me and beats me and beats me, just trying. And I'm just like, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to learn, but it's just he just studies it and just the way his brain works and no matter what he's doing, it, it's insane. He's, he's a, he's a great chess player, but you know, just little things like that and just the gravity that we have towards each other to become the best at what, whatever it is. And, you know, just to try to try to push each other in a, in a respectful and loving way. Super funny. Cause our coach actually for this soccer team just told us that we need to be playing more chess. Seriously. So. It's, it, <laughs> yeah. Um, I just have one more question. So if you were to, um, excuse me, um, what are your like other hobbies outside of like um, sports? Like how do you relax? How do you like on your days off, you could watch Netflix. What else do you do? Uh, I'm a big video game guy. I love playing video games. Uh, uh, I love just doing nothing. Um, I love just, you know, throwing my phone across the room and just laying down and just, you know, just sleeping. I'm, I'm the, I'm one of the laziest people that I know, I think. Uh, and I, I think it works in my benefit because in track and field, you have to be lazy. You have to be off your feet. You have to recover. Um, and I kind of use it as an excuse because now I'm good at it. Uh, I'm good at it being lazy. Um, but I just love, you know, just, I love traveling. Um, I love experiencing new cultures, um, and I and I'm I'm lucky enough to be able to do that uh, in my career, um, playing soccer internationally, and then you know obviously traveling internationally to run track and field, um, experience new cultures. But um, I love I, I love reading. I love watching. You know, um, I don't like watching TV because of the commercials, but I love watching Netflix. I love watching movies. I'm a big TV movie guy, um, in all genres. I'm a big anime guy. Um, I know some people think that that's weird, but I love it. I don't know why. Um, and yeah, probably video games, Netflix. Um, I love, uh, you know, motivational life books. Um, I'm reading a, uh, a book by Michael Jordan and Dwayne Wade and Kobe Bryant's trainer, um, Tim Grover. Uh, I'm, I'm reading a book by him right now, um, uh, which is amazing. And I love just, you know, spending time with my friends and family that, you know, there's so much time lost training and, and competing and traveling and not really being able to see them unless it's through FaceTime and texting. Um, so I really just try to put my phone down and enjoy the time that I have with my family and really just catch up with them and, you know, um, get that time back. I don't blame you with your busy schedule at all. <laughs> All right, Nick, um, you got a, a lot out of you there. We really appreciate that. Um, so we'll turn it back over to Dr. Murphy for some, some closing remarks. And um, again, we really appreciate you opening up and giving us a little behind the scenes. And um, it's really awesome, really awesome. 
I appreciate it. You don't have to thank me. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, Nick, this has been great. We really do appreciate it. I think that uh, a lot, got a lot of folks on the on the call tonight, and uh, we take we really do appreciate. Uh, we know how valuable your time is, and appreciate you taking the time out to be with us. And you know, as the president of the university, I don't have the authority to award Olympic uh, gold medals, uh, but I do have the authority mm -hmm. to award my presidential coin. Uh, when I see excellence, uh, I'm allowed to do that. No requirements. There's no there's no standard record book or anything like that. Uh, but when I see excellence, I'm allowed to uh, award my coin. And I want to award this coin to you uh, tonight for being with us and sharing your thoughts. Uh, you see on the one side, it has the uh, seal of uh, the university. And on the other side, it says presented by the president for excellence. And so we'll put that in the packet of goodies we're sending to you. Uh, and uh, please uh, take that. And when you when you when you feel it in your pocket or when you see it on your wall or your trophy case, uh, just remember this night that you shared with us and we how, how grateful we are that you did that. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Truly. Thank you. OK, so um, if there is any other questions that, you know, you didn't feel like was answered or something personal you wanted to to ask Nick, um, you could stay on the line for a couple of minutes after, see if Nick can answer those real quick. Um, but other than that, we really appreciate you guys coming out tonight. Um, you know, I know I learned a lot from you, Nick. Um, some similar things you said that, that I once went through um, with some injuries and things and how you gotta stay motivated. And I appreciate you coming in and speaking to all the students and the athletes here. It's really, really good job. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. No problem at all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. No one asked, no one asked any uh, funny one. questions or anything, any, anything <laughs> outside of sport or anything. I, I'm used to asking, you know, what's my favorite ice cream flavor or, you know, something like that. <laughs> I'll ask the question, what's your favorite um, Netflix series? Oh, okay. That's a good one. So, I think of all time, Netflix specifically, my favorite TV show is, I think, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is amazing, aside from the last season, because we don't speak about it because it was so bad. Um, but on Netflix, um, I'm currently watching. Oh, heads uh, up, heads up. Oh. <laughs> um, Great, he's watching... always working. Hey, that's good. That's good. Um, he's ahead <laughs> on a swivel. Um, <laughs> uh blacklist i'm finishing up i obviously want to watch you um uh, i'm a big chick flick guy too I, I watch a lot of chick flick so there's probably not a single chick flick that you could probably name movie or tv show that i haven't seen so you know i'm kind of i'm all over the place but i love netflix there's too much time on the road to watch all that and i have one more question i assume that you probably eat healthy but what's your favorite like fast food like chick-fil-a chipotle like what's your go-to if anybody follows me on social media they know what my favorite like snack or anything is and if there's anybody in here that knows say it right now and i'll give you like three seconds to say it because there's one thing above anything else that i'm just obsessed with and it's my thing and it's oreos oreos are my main are my main thing I, that's the one thing i remember talking to my nutrition my nutritionist and she was like all right well we have to cut out this this and this and i was like the only thing you can't touch are new oreos i'm gonna eat a whole sleeve while i'm training in tokyo i don't care i'm gonna do it um but i love i love chick-fil-a um i don't really like like super like like mcdonald's i don't really mcdonald's burger king taco bell anything like that that's like um that like super super fast food i don't really consider chick-fil-a as fast food um but i love chick-fil-a um uh, uh, Chipotle, uh, in any of the, the fried chicken places. Oh, so good. Any, anything like that. Oh, hey, now I'm hungry. Hey, Nick, G. Murphy here. Uh, Lady Gaga sponsors her own brand uh, of the Oreos, and she's always looking for a co-sponsor uh, for the commercial. So you might want to keep that in mind as your next gig. I love Lady Gaga, too. <laughs> Nick, my... Uh... My daughter's best friend's father runs the marketing for Oreos Global. Josh, if you give him my cell phone number, I'll pass it on over to you. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, no. about to, I'm about to call him right now. Oh, please. That would be amazing. Yeah, I'm going to call him right now. Oh, I, I eat Oreos breakfast, lunch, and dinner. 
You might not be making it to those next Olympics. <laughs> uh, those I don't Oreos. care. I, will, I, will, I don't care. I will, no matter what, I will, I will open a pack of Oreos on the start line and put them down and run out and race and still can go better. It does not matter. Those will, I will look into a camera and tell people across the world that Oreos are the reason why I won gold. I don't care. <laughs> that might be the secret ingredient. Anybody else got anything? Any questions? No, I just, uh, Nick, I just want to say thanks so much for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. It's inspiring to hear you talk. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sorry for my back down noise. I'm at a Little League baseball game. All right, you don't have to apologize at all. I completely yeah. understand. Thank you for being here. All right. So we can um, end it there. We appreciate everybody coming. Um, and uh, of course, if, if you do have anything that you want to know, just reach out to me um, and I'll try to shoot something over to Nick to see if he can get a little answer for you. Also, if anyone if anyone uh, has any other questions that, you know, you weren't comfortable saying out loud in front of everybody, if you want to DM me, you know, whether it be on Instagram or any social media at all, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, anything um, I have all I have my everything's public on mine. You know, everything's friendly on mine. So please don't hesitate to, you know, reach out to me and ask me anything. I'm always willing to help anybody in any capacity that I can. Josh? Yes. Is Karen and uh, the reporter still on for Nick? Yes, I'm here, Jean. Oh, are we going to turn over to you, Karen? Which you... Sure. Yeah, we just have to. Just a way to get everybody else off. Bye, thank you.